All right. Well, good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Any questions, project, anything whatsoever, stuff? Okay, good. All right. So today we're going to start day one, day one of the Panasonic AGDVX 200 camera camcorder. So we're going to go through the functions of this today and sort of just follow along with me as we do it. And uh, if I go too fast, stop me. If anything make, doesn't make sense, uh, stop me or whatever. Okay. So let's go ahead and start out and just grab your sticks, your tripod if you would. <clears throat> and once you have that out, talk about it for a couple seconds. So when you put away the tripod, one of the things I want you to do, be cognizant of, is that the head itself is going to be loose. The, the lock should not be tight on it. That's going to bring it to your attention because when we put it away for the evening, you know, it's going to be loose again. So the best way to open up a tripod, because a lot of times people do something like this. They open up this and they'll, you know, spread these out and then they'll put this leg and they'll keep going up and down, up and down. If you know the height, more or less, the best way is to really, you know, release the legs. And then since they're all combined, then you can get, oh, I want it about right here. Look, they're all the same length. And lock them up. And you should be good. Okay? Wait till you get all that. <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. Usually I store the panhandle loose because once you put it in the bag, you know, then it, it just folds out of the way easier. So, you know, it's up to you on that one. So once the legs are up, there is a, this is a bull, bull head mount of the head. There's a little knurled knob under here. You're going to loosen that up. And you should see a little level dead center. And if, it's, if the, the head is in your way, you can always tilt it out of the way and put the lock on it to see the little bubble head if you need to. And you're going to level it up and snug it down. Okay? Like how tight are we talking about? Uh, pretty good snug because, you know, I've, I've seen people in here that tighten it, but then when they're panning and stuff, it, it'll go, and the bowl will go. So it's, it's going to be pretty snug so it, you know, holds there. You know, you don't have to, like, get a vice grip or anything, but, you know, snug. At that point, now you can adjust your pan handle to where you like it, you know, just to get it, you know, in the way. Okay? Now, my, um, the interesting thing about this, and you're going to see it, and you're going you're gonna to notice it right away, is that when you put the, the, the uh, camera on, that this, this is the same head we, we decided to keep with it for the previous Panasonic models we had. It's always good. This one has a little wider body, and we found out it hits that. So it's kind of a little pain, but once I show you how to do it, you will uh, be fine with it. So what I do first is this is the locking mechanism. The first thing I do is I rub my finger on there to make it smooth so that the um, um, it's going to pass through it. So in other words, if that little silver thing, that lock there mechanism is protruding, it's not going to pass through that. So I always just put my finger there and I back it up until I'm just feeling it. So it'll, it'll pass through there. The second thing that you need to know about this little, this little thing here is if it does get caught like that, it's a ratchet. There's a spring in there. It pulls straight out and it can back up and then go again. Okay, the next thing on the tripod itself is the proper position is with the legs left and right of the legs. The reason is, a couple reasons. One, if it's like this, you potentially might kick it, you know, because it's right there. The second thing is, should the, the camera go down a little bit, it's going to go towards that, and look, it's going to hold it. If it's like this, if it happens to go down, um, the, um, so it does have to be more snug than I actually just did it, That's answering your question, because <laughs> I just did that. Um, you can see how it would just go. It doesn't even have to tilt. So that's the proper position on it, all that. All right, so the battery and the camera is going to be in the center of the zipper pouch. 
The battery itself has a little arrow on it. The arrow goes into the camera and you have connections. You can see the connectors on it. So I'll wait till everybody gets that. The nice thing about this battery is it has a little check button. You can push that button and you can see how much power you have on it. It's a little tachometer on it. And once you get that, open up and check the orientation of the camera, how it's in there. See how the belt is attached to it. It goes underneath the handle itself. So, see, you have a little Velcro strap. Undo the Velcro underneath the handle and pop straight out. <coughs> Once it's out, the best thing to do is to lift the optical viewfinder to the upright position. You have a little two-way switch on the back panel just to the right and drops down. The arrow points down, connectors go in, just lays flat, and you hear an audible click. Close, close. Excellent. As we place the camera on the sled itself, all cameras on all heads will go from the operator's direction away from you. And as you slide it in, you're going to hear an audible click is in. Which is already past it because I was talking. So notice I can slide it forward and aft. So here's how we balance the camera. If your camera's set up at the height and it leveled out, notice right now my camera is front heavy. I got the lock off, the tilt lock is to my right, the tilt drag is to my left. It's loose. I'm going to slide this back, slide it back, slide it back until it's level. Once it's level, I'm going to use this lever here to my right and lock it in. Once it's properly leveled, I adjust the drag, both pan and tilt. This is my pan lock, this is my pan drag, this is my tilt lock, this is my tilt drag. I want to adjust this and my pan handle to where I like it. And everything goes, notice, ease of panning, and it stays. As an operator, I don't need to crank this lock down anymore. I only need to put that on lightly if I have to go over here and get something and walk back and take it off. So, it's properly adjusted when it's going to stay in place. So I'll let you take care of that and just yell out for me if you need assistance. First time, most people have a little, a little hiccup on that thing. And so if it doesn't go in all the way, that means your lock is, needs to be backed up a little bit, typically. It should have been okay. So just line that up and it'll slide forward. There it goes. Yeah, so now with your locks off and your drag at zero, you're going to slide that physically fore and aft until it doesn't tilt backwards or forwards. So you just got to kind of let go of it and let it go. It's so scary. Oh, that's okay. You your hands here. You'll be fine. Sorry. Yeah, see, it's good. Right. So now you're unlocking. But notice, see, now this is what I was talking about. Right. So you can go a little forward like this just to back it up a little bit. And now if it's going to be a little snug. You can still do that. It's good. You're good. So now I can pull it. And let go of it, see if it's not falling anywhere. It's not. Lock it. And now adjust your drag. So that's your lock, and that's your drag here. Okay, so just adjust them where you like it. And you're going to pan and tilt. Pan and tilt with it. Oh, you got it backwards. Okay, hang on to it. So this is what I was talking about. So you got this lever. I'm going to do it until I can just feel that smooth. So sort of backing up a little bit. Okay? That's about good. So now, yeah, I'll go for it. Oh, we can pull this off. So it's going to put the thing in, goes forward, back, home. Yep, absolutely. Should audible click or not? <laughs> it didn't click in. It's probably because it's a little on the loose side here. Okay. If it's right there, it'll just you hear a snap. And see, oh, you're actually good. So here's the lock off. You actually don't have to go all the way. It'll actually fall out when it's not locked. And here's the drag. So you're going to fit it at zero. Go ahead and let go. In the front so you're going to do this. You can let go. Okay. And you're going to sit. Now, put this lock on all the way. Yep. Yep. It's locked. Okay, cool. Now, adjust your drag. That's this one. Until you like it where um, everything moves. And so pan. And here's the pan drag. This one here. Okay. So you just want to physically pan and tilt with it until it feels good. How do you feel on it? Is the uh, balance there? Let's take a look. Okay, so the lock will be off. Yeah. 
and this will be at zero. And you're basically, so it's a little back heavy, so I'm going to push it forward a little bit. Push it forward a little bit. Back her up a little bit. It didn't clear that, that thing yet. So, okay. So, that's pretty good. Now the lock here, I'm going to lock it. Now this is what I was talking about. See how it's not going to lock because it can't make the clearance? So if I clear it, and go around once, I can pull this out and back it up a little bit like that. So it's, it's a little ratchet basically. Now I can come back with it a little bit. I think I overdid it. There it is. So a little front heavy. There we go. Lock in. Now, and this should be, your pan handle is a little awkward because it's going to hit this leg. Should be out like this a little more. I'm going to pull it out a little more. Should be something like that. Really. So you can still adjust the height the way you like it. But right now, the lock's off. Doesn't have to be overly, just that soft. And the pan lock is there. This is the pan drag. You want it at zero for starting, you know, nice and loose. Get it where you like it. So, okay, now that it's loose, and then this is loose. So now you're gonna adjust the drags by doing basically this. Back and forth, back and forth. Looks a little cockeyed. I don't think it's level yet uh, to me. But now if you get to where you want to, if it's leveled right, I can pan and tilt with it and it stays, okay? Walk away from it, you put the lock on just like that. Pretty good. Everybody good with the uh, camera? Did you get it okay? Yeah. Awesome. And it's balanced okay? Yep, feels great. Awesome. Okay. Then go ahead and take your take your media card, pull it out. And there's a sliding door to the operator's left. There are two card slots. Put it in the upper. That's media slot one. That's card slot one. Just put it in that one. It does offer a dual. The contacts will face the lens. Slide the door closed, and you're all good. Let me know when you got that. Oh, it's operator left. So it's right over here. Oh, it slides over. Just like that. Yep. You put it in, and the the, the uh, contacts go towards face the lens. Confusing how this opens. Oh, the secret trap door. Ah, I see. Gotcha. Now that you know the secret trap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody good with that? Okay, cool. Okay, the power switch, there is a white little tab, which is kind of like a lock, and you kind of push in on that and then move it in the up position so the little power light comes on. <clears throat> this camera will shoot 4K, 2K, and 1080. Um, it's good, the really cool features on it, it'll shoot in macro mode, it'll shoot variable frame rate, and has variable color temperature. It's a pretty robust camera. Uh, there were some downsides with it, but overall it's a, it's a really good camcorder. Okay, the LCD screen is right up here by the mic. It just slides out and over to get to your convenience of doing it. Okay, there are a lot of features in this camera, like a boatload, and I'm going to send some information on these things. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you what I'll call the bare minimum to operate the camera that you must do. Okay, and then later, probably the next time, we will go through more items on it. Okay, but this is like, okay, I just got it. We are right now, and you put the media card in. So. The first thing you're going to do, operator's left towards the bottom, is a menu button. Pop the menu open. And by the way, the LCD is touchscreen too. So you can use the little wheel next to the menu button or just use uh, touchscreen. We are going to go to page two of the menu, other functions. Oops. Now, try that. Go. And 
Okay, so um, again, go to uh, other functions, which is page two. Other functions open up. You're going to go to page three on it, and that, those arrows go backwards and forwards. So on this, you're going to go to initial set. We're going to reset our camera. The reason we're going to reset our camera is because there's multiple users on this. We have no idea what somebody did before you in the menu, and this is the easiest way. Just put it like right out of the box again. So go to initial set, the very top one, all, and yes. And it's going to reset your camera for you. Make life easy. It'll take a couple seconds to do its magic. It defaults under reset as 2K. 2K, that means this is really where its dynamics are, that it operates really well. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Probably the number one email that I get is um, I'm trying to work on my project and it says incompatible card. This is probably what's happening. Their card is not fast read and write speed to do 2K. And it obviously wouldn't do 4K. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you a preferred 1080 mode that will shoot on pretty much every card. It's up to you. I mean, you know, by all means, if you've got a, a robust car, shoot 2K, shoot 4K. We're going to do some stuff, you know, and see what it's like to go through. I'll show you how you have to handle that in post-production. That's a later date. But I'll go through that. Okay, so I just want to let you know it defaults in 2K. Let's go back to menu again. Open it up again. <clears throat> and we're going to go to system mode, page one, system mode. The third item down on page one is record mode. Our choices are MOV, MP4, AVCHD. I'll go backwards. AVCHD is a proprietary Panavision codec. It stands for Advanced Video Codec High Definition. It is a very um, um, good recording codec. I mean, I use it when they first came out. It was actually really awesome. I don't really use it anymore. There might be some times that I might. I would recommend MOV or MP4. I use a Mac, I always go with MOV, and, uh, but it'll take MP4 too, if you have a preference. Typically, um, PC is probably the MP4 only. I mean, I don't really, um, you know, my preference is MOV, but I usually go with a very basic Mac, MOV, PC, MP4. There you go. Record format. You got two pages on it. The top one is 4K, then you got some UHD systems. Go to page two. <clears throat> Let's change this. Page two is the top one on the right column. It's going to say 1080 2997P 50M megabits. Okay, use that one. But before you leave this, I want to show something in this menu to help you understand something. Uh, if you already popped out of it, just pop back in. Okay, on page two, you see a, a number. It says 1080-5994, all I, then it's 200 megabits. The one to the right of it that I told you is 2997, 50 megabits, but it doesn't have all I. Let me explain this. All intra frame, all I, the compression uh, is a very, this is a very good post-production codec. It's, it's not a very efficient recording codec. Again, you have to have a pretty good robust card. But here's what happens. Let's just say I'm shooting at 24 frames a second. Okay, so what it does is I shoot an image. Basically, that's 24 still images every second. Takes a picture, compresses it, puts it on the card. Picture two, compresses it, puts it on a card. Picture three, you can imagine how fast that card has to read write that. That's crazy, even thinking about that. Okay, so it's going to use up a lot of space. <clears throat> the other one that's not listed, the one to the immediate right, the one I told you to, is called a long gop. GOP codec. That stands for group of pictures. How this codec works is that I have picture one, picture two, picture three, picture four, picture five, etc. And then it averages all those, compresses it, puts it on the card. It's very efficient. It doesn't use up much card space. But the long GOP is not the most efficient post-production codec where the long, where the uh, all-inch frame is. 
everything has pluses and minuses about it. For instance, we shot with six, uh, six or seven cameras at, at Howard's when I did live event, and we did the post-production with it. And because of card space, we had to shoot with the most efficient recording. We come back, and because you're multiple cameras and all that, you start cutting out middle pieces. The computer is, lo is, is lagging down because it can't find what you just took out. It has to, it has to catch up on you. You won't have that problem with all intro frame. But anyway, go to 1080, 2997, 50 meg, and hit return. Okay. Then let's go back to page two, other functions. And once you get another functions, you're going to page one is format media and go ahead and format your card one. What we just did is really all you need to do on the menu. We're going to do a couple more things, but right now, bare minimum, power it up, reset that camera, check your recording mode that you want to, you know, whatever that is, MP4, MOV, and then 1080, 2997. There you go. And then format your car. It's clear, it's good, you're ready to shoot. We're going to add a couple more. Hit exit when it finishes. Menu. We're going to go to user switch, page one, user SW. That's user switch. You're going to have all the user buttons. There's a boatload of user buttons in. I, there are two that are extremely awesome. So we're going to change them. So open up user one, please. And it defaults to page two. I'm not sure why, but go back to page one on it, on user one. And we're going to, um, I think it's page one. It could be wrong. Nope, it's not mine. Um, it's going to be the user button, so we're going to open up user one button. And I want you to assign um, um, macro on it, and it's page five on mine. Focus macro, and hit return. Did you all find that? Oh, actually, no, you're in the menu. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, so we're in the menu still. And you want to do user SW. Open up user one. Yeah, it's touch screen. Awesome. And uh, status and focus macro. Okay, return. After you get that, open up use open up user two. User two, I think it's in page five. We're gonna go to VFR. That's variable frame rate. So change that to variable frame rate. And then once you get that, exit. We'll get to those in a minute. I'll tell you about those. those. Now, when you see the manual, which will be in there, there's a lot of stuff in this camera. I mean, I could go on for a really long time. There's some nice little short videos on it. But I'll tell you what those two are. And then you can, you know, as you use the camera, you can look at some other things on it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do one last thing, and I'll explain. I might not get to this part explaining it today. I probably will. So go back to menu one last time, and page two. It's going to be display setup, DISP setup. There's a lot of items in here. I want you to go to page two on it, and we're going to at the bottom where it says gain ISO display change. I want you to change it from gain to ISO. And then the one below it, where it says zoom focus, you're going to put it to millimeter and feet, and then exit. Let me know. Everybody got that? Cool. Okay. I'll go so reverse order. <clears throat> For some reason, it defaults as number on focus, and I find that totally useless. All lenses are measured in a focal length of millimeters. When we do some projects in here, I mean, it's, it's good to have an understanding of what a, a focal length millimeter is. Like, in other words, oh, yeah, this is 18 millimeters, so 50 millimeters, et cetera. And the only way you're going to be cognizant is in the display up here in the LCD, and you're going to see what the, uh, the focal length is. And if you adjust your zoom, you're going to see on the lower right, the bottom, you're going to see a Z with a number changing next to MM in your viewfinder. And that's going to tell you what your focal length is. 
That makes more sense than just a number. That's the actual focal length for this camera. The other one, the footage, is the camera to subject distance, which I find useful too. Uh, so you know that you know how far you are away from the subject and all that. Okay? So there you go. We are now in the, uh, the mode of, um, of everything for the menu that you really need to do. Now, those other things, the user buttons and the, um, and the changing the ISO, those are optional things. I mean, if you don't use them, but we're going to use those items when we're in here at some point in time so you know about them, and I think you'll find them useful. Okay, the next thing that you do is now we operationally check the exterior buttons, okay? And we'll explain what these are. So now we're at the exterior of the camera, okay? So the first one that we're using is this button up here. It's a, it's a four-way switch. It says ND filter. Does anybody know what ND filter is? It stands for neutral density. The purpose of neutral density is to control exposure. Typically, if we're outside on a bright sunny day and everything's going to look like really blown out, it's overexposed. Okay, that's a perfect example that we need to control the exposure of the neutral density. To see it, just go ahead and engage it. Show what, see what happens with the image. It's obviously going to get really dark in here. Oh yeah, open up your, I forgot, I'll show you that. There's a little lever here. Yeah, that's it, that opened up your. Did you ever see the, uh, yep, the I won't ever lose the lens cap, lens cap? I like that a lot. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. You know how many times we've lost lens caps? I mean, it's crazy, because you put them in their pockets and all that, you know, it's like you never find it ever again. And they were expensive, because every summer we'd replace them. They were like 15 bucks a pop. Yeah. That I know. Up. But you got to get it, because that's going to protect your lens, you know, and all that. Okay, so I forgot to tell you about that, sorry. Okay, so go ahead and engage your neutral density so you can see what it's physically doing. Neutral, it's not going to change the color temperature. Density, like sunglasses. There you go. So, when you operationally check your camera, you want to put your neutral density off. So, that, you know, you're not putting up the gain now. Or you're like, oh my gosh, it's so dark in here. So, turn it off. The next button down is indicated by iris. That's your iris button. It defaults as auto iris. And that's right down here where my finger is. So go ahead and turn that on and off. And you'll see at the bottom, kind of center, when it's in auto mode, it says STD, standard. Standard iris, and then um, off. OK? So let me talk about this for a second. This is what my suggestion is of being consistent. Use both. For instance, if I was doing an interview, and I put the key on this side. OK, cool, got a light. So you use your auto iris for the bright side, let the auto iris adjust, push it to manual to lock it off. Because the problem with the auto iris, it's going to fluctuate. So, you know, there's movement, it's going to close and open and all that, and that makes it noticeable. So when you finish the shot, go back to auto, but think about going back and forth. The iris ring itself is the ring closest to the lens. If you rotate that one way or the other, and you can change the direction if you want in the menu, you're going to see a number followed by an F. So it's F and a number. And that's our F stops for my camera. Everybody see that? So that would be the iris. Yeah, so it's going to go into manual mode. Oh, we turned our thing off. So in auto mode, okay, so it says FTD there. It's auto, pushing the iris button again. And then here's the F stop. See the numbers? That's my iris. So when you finish that, go ahead and put it back to auto iris, if you would, please. Everybody good? Okay. The next thing is there are a lot of ways to focus this camera. <laughs> there is no excuse to having out-of-focus images. The first one, which I really like, is focus assist. Engage focus assist button. If it says invalid, that means you're in autofocus. So if anybody gets invalid, let me know. So every say, so you see a red outline, correct? And you see like a magnified center. So find something to focus on. And you don't have to zoom on anything. You just aim it and focus. If there's enough light on the object, you will see the red line around the subject. It's not really a really high light level in here. OK? So the zoom kind of works very nicely. I mean, that sort of that punch in effect. In the menu, you can change the outline red color to white, blue, or green. And see, like I see red on there because I'm getting reflections on that. 
So go ahead and disengage focus assist. So is the objective of the focus assist like it shows up the red border when it's in focus? Yeah, same thing with the just magnifying it so you can actually see it yeah, closer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next way is the manual method, which is for a zoom lens, the proper way is to zoom on an object. So I'm going to just zoom in tight. So use your rocker arm on the operator's right. And it's right. Yeah, right there. That's your rocker arm right there. You see how it zooms? Yeah. There is a manual zoom, which I'll show you. Does everybody zoom work? Yours does? It's on manual zoom. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Everybody working? So you zoom in all the way to the lens stops and you rotate the focus ring and then move back to your desired uh, position, what you wanted. But look how long that takes compared to that focus assist. It's pretty lengthy. I mean, it takes a while. Uh, but that is a critical focus, okay? Now, as long as the camera doesn't move, as long as the subject doesn't move, you're going to be in focus at the entire range of zoom. So what you do, set the camera up, check my focus, shoot, move. Zoom in, check my focus, shoot. Change the camera position, zoom in, etc. Every time you move the camera, you've got to check focus and you'll always be sharp. The third manner, which is pretty cool, go ahead and just rack something out of focus and throw those two crosshairs at something you want to focus. Down there it says push auto. Just push and hold that button. And it's going to focus at where the, the, the crosshairs are at. Kind of neat. Quick. I would avoid putting your focus, that middle button, into automatic, the A. So it should be an M. It's that little right there, yeah. And if it's in auto, notice go ahead and push auto focus. Or focus this. It doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's got to be manual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the auto manual button is right there. So it should be a manual. The auto manual button is right there. And uh, yeah, so it is a manual. Because yeah. if it's in auto, that's what happens. Have you focus assist? Invalid. So, so, same thing like auto iris, you gotta watch out. You don't wanna be in um, auto focus the whole time. So, we're gonna pop that out, focus assist out. And then here's manual over there. Auto, so it's an auto, notice. It won't work. So, you wanna make sure that you're shooting in manual. Okay. Cool. All right, so <laughs> lots of ways to focus a camera. Okay, now we're in the next line over. User buttons, we remember that. Depress user button one. This is macro. A little tulip shows up in the bottom. Okay, this without macro focuses about five feet as close focus with this camera. Macro is for close ups. And focus right at the lens. You can put your, I put my finger up there and I just rotate the focus ring and it's sharp in focus. Look at that shallow depth of field. I got it right up against it. You don't need to zoom in or anything. You just leave the camera wide. Did everybody see that? Was everybody able to focus on macro? Were you? So you have to, yeah, I'll do it. I'll show you. So macro's in there, good. So I'm gonna do this. Now you gotta use the focus ring, which is here. Yeah, see? Perfect, did you get it? Yeah, it's really shallow. It's crazy shallow depth of field. Actually, maybe too far away. Now you zoomed out all the way. I'm zoomed pretty close. Oh yeah. Usually, yeah. Just have that. And so there's my finger right there. That made more sense. Yeah. See. Right. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. I'm just trying to dial in exactly what it's here to do. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Let's go wide. This is where, because you can go to an extreme close up of something. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean that's. I mean you're yeah, really. Yeah, really yeah, it's yeah. a really. Macro is pretty cool. Did you get it? I think so. You think so? Let's find out. And it's pretty dark back here too. But see how shallow it gets? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where you can get some really easy shallow depth of field. Mm -hmm. I mean, for detailed close-up shots, macro works really cool. First of all, with macro, with if you're doing something for detail shot and everything else goes out of focus, your eyes are going to really easily see that which what you're shooting. And I think it looks really nice. Go ahead and turn it off. Depress user button number two. And guess what? You get variable frame rate. It'll blank out for a quick second. On the LCD left side, you're going to see the frame rate, 2997. 
And to the next side of it, I can't remember, I think it's to the left of it, <clears throat> you will see a number sort of in orange. Did everybody see that? Okay, this is variable frame rate. To adjust that frame rate, we're going to use this little wheel here. And you're going to see that number change. I want you to move it to 120. That wheel moves both ways. That's the highest frame rate it will go. Now use that wheel as a button and push it in. That, that yellow or orange color will turn blank out and turn blue. Okay. When we go at a higher frame rate, it's called over cranking. 120, well, okay, if we're at 24 frames and we move it to 48, speed would be half the speed. At 96, it'll be four times as slow. So the higher the frame rate, that'll give us slow motion. Okay? So if you want to do a slow motion shot, that's how you do it. At the other end of the spectrum is two frames a second. You want to set this on a tripod, wait a couple hours, get a sunset sunrise, or the class is changing up, you're going to get time lapse shots. It's a pretty versatile camera. Do some cool things. Note at the bottom that the audio is blanked out. Variable frame rate does not record audio. Picture only, just to be aware of. Go ahead and disengage, user two. Those two user buttons are very, very useful. I encourage you to try them, uh, both of them, when you're doing projects when you're using this camera, so you can get an idea of what you can do with it. Okay, let's press on. So we got the users, and the others, you know, got more user buttons. Below that is it says zoom, uh, manual, and servo. If it goes to manual, you can zoom manually. You can just use this little thing, and you can do a, a whip, you can do a quick zoom. Do not do that in servo because there's a motor attached to that lens, and it's going to run the motor eventually. So it doesn't matter to me, but for storing of tonight, put it back in servo. So that works. The so people that get it next are going to like, oh, I don't know, it's not working. Okay. Now we're on the, the, the row at the bottom of the camera. The first one is display mode uh, check. So if, you don't, if you're shooting and you don't want all that stuff in the uh, viewfinder, you can turn it off by just pushing that little toggle switch in the up position. And there it is, it's off. You got a clean feed. I got to check it because I want to check my battery, put it back on. If I want to check what's in my menu, push it down and hold it. And it'll actually, you don't have to hold it, uh, but it'll show user buttons. Oh, there's our user buttons there. Go to the next page, and it's, there's our gain. And ISO, there's a white balance. The next one is some output setups, and then the fourth one is back to picture. So it just gives you some quick checks of the menu that you're using. OK, the next button is gain. L, M, H. We switch gain to ISO, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But let's just talk about gain for what it is. Does anybody know what gain is? Not audio gain, this is video gain. audio. Yes, gain. Gain is your camera's sensor, the sensor in there, the chip that's in there. It's unique sensitivity to light. Okay, that's all it is. In other words, they designed this camera to be a particular sensitivity, which then you can calculate how much light is needed to use it. Now, in electronic cameras for forever, they were always set at a particular gain. There's a problem with that. The problem is, this camera, let's say its sensitivity is equivalent to a 200 ISO. This one is a 400 ISO. This one's a 500 ISO. But they didn't put electronic cameras with a sensitivity number of ISO. They did it with gain. And what they would do, whatever the native was with that camera, is zero. This 200 it was zero. This 400 was zero. This 500 was zero. What did that zero mean? You couldn't equate it to anything. And so what you had to do back then, if I'm getting a camera, I had to do a test with a chip chart and figure it out. Not really needed today. If we get to it, I'll show you how I did it in case you ever encounter that. We switched it to ISO. The native ISO of this camera is 500. It's there center to the right of the LCD. It'll say ISO 500. Everybody see that? You should be in the L mode, the low mode of gain. That's the native. You always want to try to shoot with the L mode first. Okay. Now, in gain mode, I told you that zero was the, the native. If you ever encounter gain, a good number to remember is six. For every six decibels of gain, 
you will double the sensitivity of your camera. It's a good number to know. I used to put my mid gain at 6 and my high gain at 12. What we're doing here, and when we reset the camera, we have our native ISO, 500. Our mid gain, our mid ISO is 1000. Our high ISO defaults to 2000. You can change those in the menu. At 2000, you're going to have negligible noise. But here's what it does. 500 is a native. I know this because I do it every class and I know exactly how much it is. So to get a 5.6 on f-stop on this camera at an ISO 500, I need 80 foot candles. And we do that test and we'll do it in here and you'll see it. We'll use the light meter and all that. And you'll see how much 80 foot candles looks. Okay, we switch it to 1000, we're going to double the sensitivity. And guess what? I then only need 40 foot candles of light for that. I go to 2000 ISO. All of a sudden, I only need 20 foot candles of light. So you think about that, there's a doubling and halving. Now at 2000, beyond 2000, you're going to start seeing a little noise. Do not be afraid to engage it. If you're out there and you don't have any more light and the image looks dark, it's underexposed, pop it up a little bit. You know, do it because it's going to look better ultimately. So make sure it's on L for right now. The next button toggle switch is white balance. Notice it says B, A, P, R, S, T. Put it on P, R, S, T, preset for now. Okay. In front of the camera, to the left, lower of the, the lens is a little button. It says AWB on it, automatic white balance, AWB. Okay, to the right of the LCD is a P with a number. It's going to say P3200K or P5600K. It's right oh, it's there, there on the yeah. screen, LCD. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Where the Kelvin is? Yes, that is it. Oh, yeah, that's a free. I can't sort of know which number. Okay. Okay. So, what you need to know the two most common color temperature presets on professional camcorders, and guess what? Light kits, lighting, is daylight and tungsten. Daylight, 5600 degree Kelvin, tungsten, 3200. This has an added feature. To toggle between them, just tap the little button up there. You will see it change from 5600 to 3200 and then variable. It'll say VAR with the, and the numbers are in orange. Does everybody get that? Oh, the AWB button? It's right here. So that's in preset. Okay, and this little button where my finger is, notice, changes, changes, there's my variable. So you're in variable. Okay, this is another cool thing. Okay, I'm shooting a location. It doesn't look good in neither nor. It's in neither nor. Tungsten looks okay, but not really good. Daylight looks okay, but not really good. I go to variable. Now I use the wheel and I adjust the color temperature, and you can use probably skin tone or something just to look at and what it's doing. It goes both ways, higher and lower. And then once you get a color temperature you like, you push the wheel as a button and it'll lock it in and the color will uh, go away. It'll just uh, pop out. So try the variable. It's a, it's a really cool feature on a camera to dial in the Kelvin. So where, where exactly is this? Oh, okay. Are we in variable? Uh, I don't no. Know. Okay, so here's the button up here. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And that's going to change. See how it changes in mm -hmm. Kelvin? And there's variable. Gotcha. And then the wheel. And see how it changes? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, and then once you get it what you want, I would take a oh, mental note of where it is and push that button, this one here, actually this one. Okay, so oh, the, Yeah, and so once you get it, I'm going to put that in and just push that in and then it locks it down. Gotcha. Yeah, cool. And you can lock that. So it locks it in. So you've got basically three methods on that. Okay. Most shooting locate, shooting, um, Places you're going to be, you're going to be using, if you're using kit lights or something like that, you're going to use mean daylight or tungsten. I mean, you know, you really are. You may have some mixed lighting, there's that variable. Okay, the other way to white balance, though, is putting on A or B. Go ahead and put it on the top one, B. Not all kits, they should be, but they've gotten lost over time, should have a little white card in it. 
If it doesn't, I can hold mine up so you can do it, so you don't have to pull it if you don't want to. So basically, what you're going to do, you don't really, really need to zoom into the card. You don't need to focus on it as long as it's getting a lot of, and it has to be in the light that you're using. So I'm going to hold it for you. And now you're going to push and hold the button, the AWB button. Uh, you got it? And it should say okay or something like that. Okay, got it? I'll pull it to you guys here. Go ahead and just push and hold it, it'll say okay. Does it work? Oh, I think it says okay. Oh, okay, you gotta push this button up here. So this is gonna be on B for right now. You guys, that was there. So it just fills the frame. You don't have to worry about focusing on it. You would want to use auto iris on white balancing, so the exposure to the white is good. Does that work for you? Yeah. Okay, good. Cool. Okay. I don't care which one you use. Whichever, I would say, whatever you do, I would say it's be consistent. I, I pretty much always use presets, and then the variable color temperature is awesome. So, but if you want a white balance, you know, you know that's it. But you see an A and a B switch. This is the reason for. <clears throat> okay, this will hold this white balance even if I turn this camera off and remove the battery. There's an internal watch battery in there. But there's a second one. And so a long time ago, when that's all we had, and by the way, uh, the cameras only had the Kelvin temperature on it. it didn't have like daylight tungsten or anything like that. Um, they were black and white monitors, so you didn't see the color. So you had to know what the Kelvin was and all that. Anyway, like shooting an example, when I shot news, um, and I knew, I did a lot of courtroom stuff back in the day. I knew that the courtroom is going to be a different color temperature than the hallway. I know that we're going to get an interview with the prosecutor or the defense attorney in the hallway. We're not going to stay in the courtroom. So before I go into the courtroom, I put on A or B, white balance out there, click, got it. Go inside, put it on my tripod, set it up, get the mic up there, all that stuff, set the line level, all that fun stuff. Check in there. We're rolling. Then when they're done, this is what I do. I, uh, I had my wireless stick mic, turn it on, give it to my reporter. I would let you know that it's on. I would do that. <laughs> and I would go out, and, we're, and I rely on my reporter to get that interview. All I have to do is put it back to the other button. I don't have to rewind balance. I put it back to A or B, whichever one I did outside. And now, you get the mic on them, and you know, hopefully they get their attention. And I got you for position doing this. And on the peripheral, I would see everybody else trying to white balance out there. Even though it doesn't take long, in a situation like that, seconds count. And so, you know, that's the working method that I use, and so it'll hold. The other thing I used to do in commercial work, <clears throat> the producer would have a monitor, and I would calibrate it, so it looked good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back then, <clears throat> the producer would always say, did you white balance? I did. I didn't think I liked it very well. I actually white balance, and I'll show you a different method, and you'll see why I did this. If you white balance on any color other than white, it will produce the opposite effect. So I used to white balance on a very light blue. It would, the skin tones would be warmer. So on A, the blue card, on B, the white card, and then the preset of whatever light. So I would say, do you like this, the preset, or this, the white balance, or this, the blue? They never, ever chose white balancing. Zero. <coughs> they preset or the blue. <clears throat> on it, and it's very really lively, but we'll sh I'll show you that I didn't actually bring my card with me. Anyway, that's what the other switches are. Put it back on preset if you would, and I don't care which one it is on. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm drink water. Um, you saw the wheel, and um, the menu button there. So I already know that. The next button over is shutter. The shutter defaults to automatic when you reset. We know it's automatic too because looking at the LCD on the right side is a little, um, it should show shutter, a shutter. Okay. 
Anyway, shutter. Does anybody know what the shutter does? What the purpose, purpose of the shutter is? The shutter also controls exposure. <clears throat> this is what the shutter does. This is an electronic shutter, of course. And basically, in the electronics, it's just turning it on and off very rapidly. But I think it's easier to think about it in a mechanical shutter. <clears throat> on a mechanical camera, it's a, it's a think of a big pie tin. So 180 degree circle that's slit in half. So half of it, the pie tin is still there, and the other half, it's just open. It rotates. It physically did rotate. And here's the aperture where the frame. So the frame comes down, the shutter comes by, it's closed, it opens, exposure, closes, next frame, opens, closes, next frame, open. So 24 frames, it's doing that. And it's like amazing when you think about that it does, it does this. So <clears throat> at 24 frames a second, without a shutter, you're probably going to say, well, the exposure is 1 24th of a second. Okay? But with a 180 degree shutter, which all cameras are based upon, at least in, in, in the, for the most part, there are exceptions, um, <clears throat> is exposing that frame for half the time. Therefore, the exposure is 1 48th of a second. In a DSLR, if you shoot with a DSLR, your shutter should be, like I told you in the Nikon, at 1 50th. That's the closest to 1 48th. And that's a proper shutter where we get the proper exposure for the frame rate and what we perceive as, as motion. If the shutters open up too much, you're going to get more light in, which is great, but you're going to start getting blurring motion. If it's too fast, it's going to blank it out and decrease the light coming through it, but it's going to give a jarring effect. For instance, if this was like my arm going up, you would have still frame, still frame, still frame, still frame, still frame, etc. And it would look like this. But with the, if the shutter is on longer, then we're not going to see the next stop. We're going to see picture, picture, picture. So it's going to be missing pieces to it, and it's going to look really jarry. They do a lot of that. They've done it like in zombie movies and stuff like that, so the zombies look funky, plus the makeup uh, and all that. But there is reasons for that. To adjust the shutter, press the shutter button, use the wheel. <clears throat> Notice you can make it darker or brighter. Go ahead and the wheel goes both ways, so make it nice and bright. And then you can move your hand in front of the shutter, or the, the viewfinder, and actually um, see it's, it's blurry when you move it. I have used open shutters when I did time-lapse stuff. I've used open shutters when I didn't want to use gain, knowing that there would be some motion blur. If there's no movement in it, you got this on a tripod, you can do some really nice stuff at night. I've seen some really cool desert stuff at night with an open shutter. It looks super cool. So the shutter can open up. If it goes the other way, you'll see it get darker and it'll get more. So in a normal in a normal condition, you're going to put the auto. Um, you're going to go to auto um, shutter, which defaults it to. If you want to have some kind of um, you know motion or something like that then you can um, just open it up or close it. Okay? Does that make sense? So auto shutter. The next button over, it says auto manual. <clears throat> Always have to manual, but go ahead and engage to auto. Next to the battery icon, you're going to see a big A. So if you ever see the A, then it's an auto. Take it out because it's going to override your settings and all that. Put it back to manual. Now we're in the red area of the camera. The three little buttons, user button five, six, and seven. OIS. The little icon in the, um, in the LCD is a little wavy hand there in the upper right, right below the battery. It defaults is on. If you push the button, it's going to turn it off. You'll have a line through it. OIS is optical image stabilizer. <clears throat> Panasonic's been working on it for years. Uh, this one's pretty good. The stabilization of the GH5 is amazing. It doesn't even need a gimbal. It's crazy. So, you know, like when you're hand holding and stuff, it can take the edge off of it. It also reduces any vibrations, not just like hand holding, but just general vibrations that might be like a little bit of wind movement or something that might do very brief, but it would you would notice it. And so it will take away stuff like that. Zebras. 
Zebras, push that. You'll see the first one is 80%, second one 100%, the third one is marker on, then the fourth one is off. <laughs> I used zebras many years ago. Um, I don't really use them that frequently, but let me tell you what they are. Zebras indicate an area of specific brightness. Skin tones are between 70 and 80% IRE. So if you had it set at the 80 and had me properly lit, and you aim the camera at me, you would see these diagonal lines of zebra patterns across my face. Most people will put zebras at 100. So in the overexposure, white, that they would know so they wouldn't have clipping. Okay? And you can. I mean, a lot of people put them at, at 100. But you don't want to know that they're at 100 and think they're at 80 and get my face. Because if I had the zebra patterns across my face and it was set at 100, I would be way overexposed. You can engage them and point them up to a light or something. You'll see the zebras. See what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter if they're 80. They're, they're blown out. So you'll see these diagonal lines. Those diagonal lines do not record. And that's what they are. So you can turn them off if you like. But that's a way to gauge exposure. The best way to gauge exposure is the waveform monitor. That's the next button up. It's WFM, waveform monitor. <clears throat> Go ahead and engage that. You see a little, it's up in the upper left. That is going to show every place of exposure. I suggest using it. It's a little wonky at first to get you used to it, uh, but it measures, a waveform monitor measures luminance. With it up, you can move your hand in front of it and you see a graphical representation of the scene. So you see it's kind of very matrix-ish. Therefore, that middle line, solid line, is 50%. It's in 10% 10, 10, uh, increments. So above that is 60, 70, 80. So when you light an interview or whatever, a person's face, that's where you want them to lie within there. If there's a white level, then it's of a white reference, like the well, it's over behind the curtain. Uh, I have a white t-shirt on or something like that. Guess what? That's going to be up to 100%. In UHD, this will go up to 110, but we still peak a lot of times at 100, knowing that we got a little threshold there. It's fine. So it's going to show not a specific area, it's going to show everything within your frame of where it is. If you're shooting and you are below 50% overall and you can't put any more lighting, what do you need to engage on your camera? Bring up that ISO, the game, and it'll pop it up a little bit. You can use your waveform monitor now and pop it on and watch it pop up. You can see it double, it'll go up in increments. And there it is. I got mine at 2,000 and it just did the whole gamut right there. The most common method of gauging exposure is that LCD screen. The worst method of engaging and of gauging your exposure is, guess what, the LCD screen. It's not, it's not calibrated. So the best method is this waveform monitor. Go ahead and pop it off. I encourage you to use it. <clears throat> if you increase your, your gain, go ahead and put it back to low if you would. The last items on the camera. Open up the little secret door there to open up the audio. It's the larger door, the one by the, the battery compartment. On the far left, you have input one, input two. You have choices. You have line, mic, plus 48V. Does anybody know the difference between line and mic? Anybody remember the difference? I said you would, it will come back when I was talking about it. And this is that time. The strength of the signal, right? Yes. A line is a one volt signal. Oh, we're back here. Oh, okay. no, there. Oh, that's okay. I'm sorry. A line is a one volt signal. A mic level is a one ten thousandth volt signal. If this lever is set to mic, 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 and I actually pull a line level and plug it into the camera, my audio will be crazy hot. I will never be able to get a normal level out of it. It will just be overmodulated. <clears throat> if my lever is set to line and I pull a mic into it and plug it in, I won't get anything at all. There's not enough, enough to do it. Mic to mic, line to line. It is really the number one reason why people don't come back with audio. It's set to, it's set to line. They weren't wearing headphones. They weren't paying attention. They come back and they got nothing. And they think the mic's broken. And then I look over here, and I said, you were on line level. I would say that's the number one audio, no audio, I, I forgot to get audio today. 
<laughs> issue. The third one down is plus 48V, phantom power. Phantom power will power up a condenser microphone, a microphone that needs a battery in it. If you're using a condenser mic, use plus 48V. If you have a dynamic mic, don't turn it on because it'll give you a buzz or a hum. If you would, put both of them on mic for me, please. The next two levers over on channel one, channel two is internal, input one, input two. Internal is the internal microphone. It's right up here. It's an omnidirectional microphone. Input one is the one up here where I can attach a shotgun mic, a unidirectional here, which we have the Rode mics, and plug it in there. Input two is one way back here at the bottom. They have, some of them have the little dust covers on them. That's the second most missing item. Actually, it's since we have the, I won't lose the lens cap, lens cap, it's um, the dust covers have become the number one missing item. The next one over, channel one, channel two, auto and manual. <clears throat> if I'm recording that sound of the internal microphone, I'm gonna put it to auto and it'll do fine. I want to put it to manual if I'm getting an interview, something critical. Critical audio manual, but if you're just getting natural sound, auto is fine. Questions? That's a lot of stuff. I used to go through every single menu item and I realized everybody's numb before I get to page two. That's why I minimize it. Reset the camera, recording format, and all that. No, I went a lot because I wanted you to tell what these buttons are and all that, and you should know those. Um, I mean, expect those on the final. Expect what is neutral ND filter, what is gain. And you'll hear them again, but as long as you know. So what I want you to do right now is, if you would, go ahead and put menu and reset your camera. Once more time. And that was page two, other functions, page three and other functions, initial set, all yes. I do have a question. Actually. Yes. Will microphones generally have it labeled what kind of power they need? Or no. All professional microphones will. Excellent question. Because no, all professional microphones will be a mic level. Okay. Yeah. And all external stuff like uh, podium audio, uh, audio coming from a band playing, all that, are typically line. They always were line at one point. Today, you will see a mix. In other words, if I'm going and want to get, I want to punch into some audio and you're the audio person, hey, can I, get a, can I get a level from you? And you know, they all say, oh yeah, sure. And you know, do you want a mic or line? Do you want a, one, you know, and I'll say, you know, whatever. So you just gotta kind of figure it out. Yeah, then you'd act. Le but mic level's the standard <coughs> for, yeah. for anything. For all do. microphones, but okay. you know, you go over there at the Union, and um, they're, they have a speaker at the podium, and you got these audio boxes here in the back of the room, mm -hmm. you plug in, oh, that's awesome. Those are line levels, I know that. But here's the thing, you're gonna know if you plug it in and you aren't sure, and you're getting this hot audio and you turn it down and you can't get anything, then first thing you want to do is put that to line. If you're not getting anything, check that. You know, you know, mic to mic, line to line. After it's reset, go ahead and close the uh, the lens cap if you would, and and close the LCD. Power down your camera. Remove the the, the media card. Put it in the little case. Remove the battery. Battery will go in the kit. Again, the zipper pouch, if you would, please. In the center of the little pouch, so I know where they're all at. They're all gonna be simple. I always put my zippers in the center. We're gonna remove the camera camera comes off, it, it uh, release the little locking mechanism, slide the camera towards you, the little, little lock releases to the operator's left there. Make sure you put the camera in orient right because the belt, the safety belt is going to go under the handle, so it's, it's, um, it only goes in one way. And I'll check it before you close it up. You have trouble getting the camera off? Let me know. There's a little yeah. You want to loosen that and slide it right towards you. And then there's a lock on this side here. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Button. There's a slot. There you go. Cool. You get it? Oh. Okay. That lock there. Loosen that up. Hold it. 
slide it towards you. Get the lock there. Oh, no. Did you already have a push? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> eh, whatever. I always put the lock back in just so it doesn't. Sometimes it gets loose and it just falls off. Oh, okay. Yeah, but that's cool. Doesn't it? And remember, take the locks off the. Um, that should slide right towards you. Oh, okay, so this is really tight. Oh, it is. So. Yeah. And there's a lock here, too. So that's going to lock out. That's going to slide right oh, in. Oh, okay. Well, that's why you take that out. That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 So that's like right here. It's a little release button there. Yeah. All right. I just didn't. I felt like it was that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, never force anything, so it's always good. <laughs> Not this. Did you get it? All right. Okay. So you're going to loosen that, and it's going to slide towards you. Here's the lock. Here's the release lock there. Push that one up, and slide it right towards you. There you go. Cool. Okay. Make some batteries out, put it in the zipper pouch in the center. Take the locks off the um, the tripod and put the, the drags at zero or at loose so it's, it moves very freely. You can loosen up the pan handle too so it just drops straight down. Pick up the leg stread center. In the tripod, the head goes to the flat side of the bag. little safety belt on it. Do you want the media card outside the bag? Uh, yes, I'll collect those. Thank you. Oh, that fell out, didn't it? screen pops out it's a little wing basically it's it pretty windy here if you haven't noticed so it was up way high and they didn't have it balanced properly so that wind took it and it took it and flew it and that whole top mechanism part where the microphone is and that LCD it's now dangling by a bunch of little wires so that got broke one time somebody left one a case out in the parking lot unattended Fortunately, I got a call from administration building that I think I have one of your bags. So I looked it up and of course I can tell who checked it out. Oh, about a half hour later, they came in, they were stressing. And I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> and like, you looking for this? Oh my God. Yeah. I, I only stepped away for us. So you stepped away long enough for somebody <laughs> to grab it, you know? 
So I don't care how long it's like, let this be a lesson, you know, that, you know, you had a, he had a moment of panic, but, you know, um, you know, we had it. <laughs> just don't do it again. So just treat the camera equipment really good. It's a good camera. I'd say that, you know, the pluses, that variable frame rate, that macro on it, the variable color temperature, really cool things. It's all included, you know, this whole thing. Got the XLR connectors in it. Pretty, pretty sweet. Nice, to, easy to handhold. Um, downside is even though it has an ISO 500, that lens is not like crazy fast. So, um, but it's, it's okay. Uh, you just notice you'll need a lot more light uh, interiors in some locations. But like I said, just increase that ISO up if you need to. Because all of a sudden, you, you know, you gain a stop, and then if you go two stops, you got that. So it'll, it'll handle it pretty good. Any questions? Okay, we'll continue on this on Monday. So we'll pick this up again and again, and then we'll start doing, um, and see, this is where it changes up a little bit just because of the situation we're in. But we usually do little, little projects and things like that, too, as we press in. But I also want to show you the other thing that it does, it shoots in V-Log L mode, which is kind of a raw, it's not raw, but you know, it's just the best way to explain it. By doing that, it actually has more dynamic range. It looks really crappy because it's really flat looking. You have to do in post-production, but I'll show you that. I'll show you a little bit. We'll shoot something uh, just so you get an idea of what that is. And also, I'll show you how to, to put 4K or 2K into post-production into Adobe um, so that if you do a project, you'll be able to handle it in your computer, hopefully. You know. But it makes it's a proxy file is what it is. It's really easy, but if you've never seen it, you don't know what it is, so, um, and all that stuff. So we'll do that. Any questions for me? Anything whatsoever? All right. Well, that will conclude for today. Hope you got a lot out of this one, and I will, I will hang for a little bit if you need to talk to me individually. Other than that, have a great rest of evening, and I will see you next time. Actually, I did, I did just think of two things real quick, actually. Sure, no problem. Um, first one is, might sound ultra specific, is there a setting on these cameras to adjust the sensitivity of the rocker, the zoom rocker? On the top one, I believe there is. Okay. And I think it's like a, like a three-way position switch. I have to double right. check that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's buried somewhere. But yeah, I always forget that I, there, I know the previous camera does. I can't remember if this one did. Yeah, but I believe just, it does. Yeah, it's just a very slow push. Yeah, oh, and it's really crazy oh, I, slow. I wish I could just make this go faster. Now, I know the top one does have, let me, I can, I can I'll tell you if I, pretty much guarantee you if I can see. There's a, yeah, here it is. Uh, oh, I forgot to show. There's another record button there. Oh, and no, this one doesn't. So the previous version of this had a one, two, three on there. Uh huh. So it was the speed yeah. on that one. But yeah, I just go through that. I don't know. Hmm. I also forgot to show this button here. Up here, this is where you do playback. Okay. Your thumbnails. I get you. And that's where your counter is and the color bars. But yeah. I always forget that one because I never play back anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, where um, do you play back? Oh. Uh, to think about it. Oh, other question was um, equipment return tomorrow. When is that available? Uh, small Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we're open nine to five. Nine to five. Okay, I can just come in and there'll be somebody there. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Sounds excellent. Okay, doke. Have a good one. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Bum 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 bum. I guess I'll fill that for.